distribution of rays that you have to compute. So every ray creates a distribution of rays. Every one of those rays queries the environment, creates another distribution of rays. So you have a large set of paths uh, in an environment. But Rembrandt solved this. Um, this was called the night watch because um, they thought it was actually a uh, depiction of something at night. Turns out when they removed the, re removed the scum from the varnish, it was actually daylight. So um, they, they kind of changed the name. But, but look, at, look at the wonderful use of light here. I mean, this is a, one of the most famous paintings in the world. But look at how, in fact, the main figure doesn't have much light actually on him. He, um, Rembrandt is using chiaroscuro to, to uh, bring him out. Um, look as well at the, the way in which self-shadowing is used to create a garment but the shadow is still being depicted on top of self-shadow. Really remarkable. Uh, just, a, just a beautiful piece of work. So when I look at this kind of thing, it's very humbling. Um, it's, uh, this is, these are multiple, multiple visibility occlusions that are going on. He's got it right. And he's got these beautiful smooth shadows in, in, the, in the background, sorry, on the floor. Um, this is the first transparent, this example of transparency that, I, that have, I've been able to find, 70 AD, uh, from, from uh, a Pompey fres fresco. Uh, the only thing they didn't get was refraction. This is kind of a more modern image with nice shadows, uh, some nice highlights, um, and a variety of interesting reflections, light taking on the color of various, um, various transmission phenomena and so on. So this, would, this on modern computers now takes about an hour to compute. So we got portraits, various sorts. Portraits always seem to move. It's one of the things when you see the masters do portraits. Um, they always seem to have some story to tell. This is an interesting one from 200 AD, and the reason why I like it is because someone did a computer graphics kind of version of that. Um, and it's got some nice uh, subsurface scattering. We've got some nice effects in here. Uh, slightly glassy-eyed, but that's what tends to happen in graphics. Here's another one that's synthetic as well. So this is the more modern version of what people use our technology for. Um, and this is what real people do, what real artists do. Completely economical use of the easy conveying, simple conveyance of this guy being very dull, this guy being very aware and annoyed. Uh, just, uh, just beautiful, just beautifully economical statements. Even more economical in that, in this sense. One, you know, Hirschfeld has completely characterized himself in, these, in just a few strokes. Um, the other aspect of, of some of our requirements is that sometimes realism is psychological, even if it's photorealistic. In this case, Chris Landreth, uh, uh, a friend and a Academy Award winner, um, used, used, a, uh, used Maya, a production system, but he started carving things away. And if you look carefully, you'll see images of his remembrance of this particular person um, in his own brain. Um, this is the kind of stuff I do, by the way, these things like this, you know, politically incorrect stuff like smoke. And, and this mixture of, of elements makes it quite difficult to characterize all of the algorithms we use in the field. Uh, we have um, uh, non-photorealistic rendering here, more, more realistic smoke amid the, amid the non-photorealistic rendering. So um, I'm going to try to do this. I did an experiment with a facial animation class I did that was really mostly taught by Chris. Uh, and I want to show you the effect um, that I wanted. I wanted to prove that technical graduate students could do interesting animation. So let's hope this works. Whoa. Oh my god! Oh my god! Oh, oh my god! Woo! Oh, oh wow! Woo! Yeah! Does anyone know where that comes from? It's the double rainbow. So what's interesting about that double rainbow? I know we've lost the screen again. Okay, good. Um, um, sorry guys, I'm not quite sure why this is happening. Let's try um, duplicating the displays again. So um, that one is an interesting one. It was his own. Um, so uh, we call him Yosemite Dan. You'll see this. Uh, you'll see this on uh, YouTube anytime. It's an extremely popular video, and it's just lovely. This fellow has this completely over-the-top reaction to um, this double rainbow. It is actually beautiful. His reaction is beautiful and innocent and just wondrous. Uh, what's interesting about this is that we we were wondering, well, you know, how would we depict him 
um, saying these things rather than seeing the double rainbow. Uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, he's not a computer animator, um, and we wanted to get to, we wanted to really study some of these things to understand more about what it takes to do good computer animation, even as a technical person. Um, if you uh, look at some of the classical animation, you'll see some really interesting things. This um, Dumbo uh, came on the heels of the financial disaster of Pinocchio. And as a consequence, they had something like one-tenth the budget. And I think um, that it's my favorite. If you look at the number of very small lines, you'll see, well, there's some fluid dynamics there. Um, you'll, see, you'll see some just, just a remarkably um, compressed um, uh, it's a, a remarkable compression to convey some very deep emotion. Um, that notion of compression is just hard to char uh, characterize um, in any kind of mathematical sense. Um, I'm going to skip this part, but if you think about why depiction works, you just, I can substitute in that, black, in that black screen, I can just simply say there's a, there's a car about to come out with the headlights coming on. And of course your visual cortex is going to, be, is going to actually be engaged, but you're looking at a black, blank screen. We of course have a lot of reuse a neurological reuse in the brain, and as a consequence, we we create signals, um, uh, we we interpret signals in, internally by doing some kind of modeling that that at least tries to track the uh, the external and the internal. So we find some some kind of a correspondence. Now, just just to remind you how difficult this is, if you fixate on this um, on this cross, you may see a couple of things. Um, some of you may see green. Uh, some of you will probably see, most of you see moving ball. Some of you may see everything disappearing. Are, are people, I don't know what, are people seeing balls disappearing completely? Who, has everybody seen green? Yeah, good. So there's no green. Um, and uh, so this, read, uh, this is one of my favorite illusions because in fact it's, this is why animation works. There's not, all that's happening is we're selectively turning off a magenta ball. But you're getting green effects, you're getting chromatic, kind of chroma chromatic persistence, and so on. So these kinds of effects are um, a byproduct of the of simply turning on a magenta a magenta ball. Likewise, you may, some people may perceive motion there. Um, uh, this is a classic Ted Allison um, uh, uh, vision experiment. You'll notice that these things be, appear appear to be uh, the shades A and B appear to be the same shade. In here, they now appear quite different. Uh, and you can see immediately that, in fact, they are the same. And of course, what's happening here is, is, uh, is that the brain is working hard to make sense of the three-dimensional vis visual cues of the shadowing effect. But B and A certainly are the same shade. Likewise, we have something stranger going on here. We have the effect of stereotype and culture. So let's, um, let's just turn this slightly this way and look at how quickly we respond to stereotype. So we, we can create this effect. Um, and what, what, is, what, is, what is remarkable about, about this is how, how, um, how coded this is. Um, so, so as a field person, these are the sorts of things we have, to, we have to cope with in some way in terms of the way we, we look at tools. So we have classic example of facial processing. I'm sure everyone's seen this, um, that uh, uh, facial processing is orientation specific. So I did this to myself. This, this, uh, this handsome lad here, did a little photoshopping. This looks almost okay, but that looks gruesome. Um, so, and all they've done is just change the orientation. Um, just to give you a sense. This is a mask specially commissioned for our website. The front of the mask and the back of the mask, which of course is hollow. And a suction thing really happens when you hold it up to the light. Because Einstein had to move. I'm not moving the mask, I'm not moving the back head. So um, moon, uh, most people know the moon illusion. I, I won't. I won't spend time with that. So color. So straight lines go curved. We all know this. So so um, what I like to do is give you a, a small. Rather than trying to characterize this in the large, let's look at a small situation in which we can kind of look at why L2 error and, and it kind of be, or any LP metric becomes a little bit tricky. So let's look at the problem of what this is actually is a motion blurred eight ball from a figure from one of the from, from an eight ball of a of a of a of a pool ball. 
uh, from the eight on a pool ball. What we've done is simply <coughs> taken that texture and, and kind of moved it from, from the top left to the bottom right. And we've used Gaussian quadrature to actually compute the um, exposure of that thing under a finite aperture. So in other words, it's being, it's being blurred as, it, as it's going. However, it's undersampled. And what you can clearly see are, are banding effects due to the undersampling. Basically, we've used uh, uh, an insufficiently lower uh, Gaussian quadrature method. In other words, an insufficient number of nodal points. Now, we know that Gaussian quadrature is optimal for, for, a class of, uh, for the, the integration of, of, of a fairly wide class of smooth functions. Um, however, adding a little noise for, mon for many people makes it look better. This is clearly suboptimal. It's 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 it, from an L2 perspective, um, but it, it but it tends to look better in black and white. You'll set, tend to see the same things, and you'll see that this is the classic classic example of how half toning sometimes helps. Um, just seeing these things side by side. One of the things that then starts to happen if you start to move these things, then these bands start to barber pull, and they become even worse. So when things move, we detect them even better. And here what you, here you can see what's happening kind of at a micro scale uh, that that coherent error is being traded off for incoherent noise. They're both error, but they're both, they're both, they're just different, uh, different qualities of error. Which is one of the reasons, by the way, why, why people will introduce things like regularization terms, an L1 regularization, or higher order regularization terms, to try to smooth things out in various ways. So what's happening? Well, the human visual system, of course, uh, doesn't just sense things. It kind of makes sense of things. So just to uh, drive this point home, uh, um, if, let's look at the problem of in image quantization where we have n rows by n columns. Uh, we, want to, we want to quantize that to a small number of gray levels or colors. And um, you can ask, well, how do we do? So this is, this is a, a, a picture of yours truly done by um, uh, someone who actually knows how to take pictures. Um, just, this is just eight bits per pixel. This is a single, this is a single bit. This is with error diffusion. The single bit, uh, th this picture, has actually less error than this picture in it uh, from an L2 perspective. Uh, this is two bits. This is two bits error diffusion. This is four bits with error diffusion. We've got that. It's in essentially indistinguishable from eight. Um, likewise, I designed this many years ago, but, but a poor robot who uh, was, had an unfortunate incident. Um, and this is what, what I like about this image, apart from the fact it's vulgar, is that it has some interesting and subtle highlights in it. And as a consequence, you can study how you seem to be able to restore detail um, in, in using, using error diffusion. Uh, you can see this is, this is a quantized version to, uh, of, of only three bits, um, but there's no error diffusion. As soon as we have error diffusion, we seem to resolve highlights and things a little better. So the thing that's interesting about this, on a per pixel basis, the actual mean error is higher uh, using error diffusion than using, using just the uh, threshold version. Um, just to remind, remind yourself of this, matrix style virtual worlds a few years away. This was done in, in 2008. About every week I see one of these and I've yet to, I think a few years have passed. I don't, have not seen a matrix like virtual world. So um, even when we seem to get it right, I want to show you that we get it, can get it very wrong. Um, but this, is a, I think it's, it's a, still a good example. Um, now, those of you who've seen Creepy Girl, um, so it takes about three seconds for me to get creeped out by her. Um, so this is an example, uh, so she'll follow. Uh, this is an example of a pretty well rendered image, but there's something creepy about her. <laughs> and th this, this, is, this is the dilemma that we face in the field. Um, you can get all of the light transport correct, reasonably good hair modeling. The hair's wrong about here, you can see it kind of stretching. Uh, but this, and her hair is, a, her eyes are way too bloodshot. Uh, there's, there's just something creepy there. Um, but in any case, uh, some people call out the uncanny valley. I just call it the zombie effect. Um, uh, uncanny valley is too, to my mind, just too, meta, too uh, metaphorical um, to actually be of any real use in terms of trying to understand these things. Whereas zombie effects has no pretenses at least. Um, so just to remind you what graphics looks like, this is what we do. This is why I say give us all your algorithms. We are doing, um, we're doing a lot of things at different stages. There's, uh, the modeling stage largely has got a kind of a geometric angle. We do a lot of geometry, lots of interesting data structures. We have to learn how to twist and deform and put together objects. The animation part is how you make things move. And in, in that situation, we'll again take just about anything. My uh, particular um, uh, interests are typically in dynamics and simulation with some, with, with behavior and, and um, control theory. Lots of optimization, so kind of the bottom parts. Um, and then um, just about all of those things in rendering. So uh, each of the, each step has got high complexity 
and even worse, is uh, prone to that nasty user getting involved and doing things. So um, sometimes trying to formalize these things is sort of helpful. So suppose we want to compute an image as a function of time. In other words, a sequence of images gives us, gives us an animation. And I'm going to punt on the notion of, Im of an image model. Um, actually, images are notoriously poorly understood, uh, but that's a, that's a separate topic. So what we're going to take in is a scene described as some object in Euclidean space with some material properties, like, you know, it's wood veneer or stainless steel or something like that. Um, some volumetric things, someone might be smoking, there might be particles of dust in the air, might be clouds around. There's going to be some camera modeling parameters. Uh, there's going to be a viewing and imaging model. I treat these as slightly differently. A camera might have a lens, it might have a variety of different properties, um, and we're going to, then we're going to take that camera and situate it in various places and image it in, in different ways and take advantage perhaps of different uh, uh, of different kinds of uh, platforms at some point. So we have light source models, they may be objects themselves, and time, everything can, everything can vary. So um, the viewing, mo so V itself then um, will have at least these things, some kind of viewing model, some, so let's put all these together, some kind of a device model, a model of where this thing is going, and presumably some throughput requirements. Something has to be rendered at a 30th of a second is going to be different than something that's rendered uh, over the course of a month. So a lot of light transport solutions are, take weeks to solve, and the stuff you play in video games it has to be solved at a 30th of a second. So very different throughput requirements will drive a different kind of interpretation of what we can do with that scene. So we can ask if that's good enough, and we kind of saw that it wasn't because the human visual system and, and other things weren't really, aren't really involved. So we probably should take into account the human, vi uh, human visual system. And as we now start to, start to pump up the rendering semantics, we start to find, we, start, we can ask other questions. Well, is it really good enough just to have the human visual system? No, I mean, if we want to render things like Dumbo or Chris Landreth's kind of photorealistic, photorealistic bits together with non-photorealistic bits. It's a little tricky just, um, just to have a, um, just to be able, just to render in one particular way. So we need sort of a style parameter in there as well, however you might do that. Um, well, and then you can ask, well, what else do we need? And you can say, well, somehow the notion of the story itself might, might, might have an effect. Now, obviously, I'm, I'm um, starting to push, push the envelope of what can be done merely with technology. A user has to be involved in here at some point. But you can see where I'm getting at. The, the, um, we seem to have this endless set of expectations. And even when we think we're done from the point of view of narrative, along come some people decide they want behaviors in their characters. This is uh, just out of an editing, the editor for Spore. So we'll really need something more complex as, as to what a scene is. A scene is going to have to be something uh, it's, it's going to have to have some geometry, some material properties, some kind of evolutionary model, I mean how it can change, some behavioral model, namely how it can interact, and something, something I that sort of puts it all together in, in terms of how all these things interact overall. And, um, and then we can kind of condition this by budget and, and a variety of other constraints. So really what this thing has, has now become known as, by the way, is, is what, what people now will call a digital asset. A lot of people are starting to sell these things. So you'll, you'll spend a lot of time constructing something within a production, re a production modeling system, um, maybe a really, really good face that does a variety of things, it's emotive and so on. You'll package it now. Packaging itself is an interesting problem. Um, and then try to sell it, or at least try to commoditize it uh, in various ways. So in the limit, um, uh, I'm not going to do a reduction, I'm not going to use the reduction symbol, but in the, uh, because I'm not really sure what reduces to what. In the limit, AI certainly and, and, um, and this image semantics is, uh, are kind of on a par, because that'll give us virtual humans that talk and walk and can interact with regular people. Um, I always loved this guy, Vlad, Vlad uh, Bill Teitla. His, his name was never Bill, it's Vladimir Peter Teitla. He's the guy who did Dumbo, uh, but he called himself Bill. Never really, quite, never really understood that. In any case, we want to encapsulate some of the knowledge uh, of, of him uh, so that it interacts well, or uh, so that, so that uh, regular people potentially could at least be motivated um, to do animations uh, along the lines of what he did. No one can ever do the virtuoso thing, except for virtuosos, of what Teitla did for Dumbo. But it would be really nice if we could embed enough knowledge in uh, production systems to allow um, animations to be created by regular people to be really expressive. Um, we need biomechanics render, we need biomechanics in these systems so that we get simulated creatures with muscles that can act and interact with the real physical world. And we need aesthetics somehow to give us some social and cultural awareness. We need light transport, which will, sim will, will simulate virtual environments. Okay. 
and um, so obviously we won't be, won't be um, um, unemployed for a long time to come. I want to talk a tiny bit about educational perspectives. Um, first is that there's a, ton, uh, there's a ton of chasms. One is that b between what we call the classroom, whether it's at the undergraduate or graduate levels, and practice. Uh, the guys in practice, guys and girls in practice are doing really hard work, but it involves a different kind of synthesis than what we, than what we teach, of course, in, um, uh, in the classroom. Uh, there's a, a, likewise a similar problem between, between those doing their master's and PhD theses and the software products that uh, their uh, innovations might end up in. And there's a huge gulf between the products and the artists or users. So that's one, that's, that's, there's three, at least three chasms there, probably more. So I'm kind of arguing now, I actually am now directing a professional master's program in which we're trying to look at these things at the University of Toronto. Um, as if, I, I, after being department chair, I promised I wouldn't run anything again. Uh, but somehow I got into this because I actually like the idea. Um, I think that the only way to do this is actually take people outside of the, the university. Um, get people in, in, embedded get them into uh, real software development houses, into uh, production houses, work with artists, um, and use perhaps a professional program to kind of go between the two. And I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you. So in the model, it would work uh, it, somehow in, in, the, in that I, that I, uh, uh, that, that the, the interaction model. So you've got objects um, hitting one another, and the, the problem there, of course, is that you might have a completely smooth system, uh, but I might bump into something, and suddenly there's a collision that's nonlinear thing. In fact, just a foot strike's nonlinear. Uh, so swinging a foot is really a rather beautiful C2 system, right? So beautiful. As soon as you kick something, though. Uh, you've got a collision. You've got now uh, a different kind of a different kind of problem, both geometric and mechanical. Which is one reason, by the way, why I think geometric mechanics is another area uh, is is, a, is actually a rather interesting place for uh, to, uh, an area of, of, of exploration for computer graphics. So, uh, but what, what measurement of what of what of what phenomena though? Uh, you know, the differing, for example. Yes. So um, the the usual thing that can be used is um, um, you can do uh, uh, what this proves really is nothing more than L two on a pixel by pixel basis is, is not is not good or L L L P. Um, but you can take windows and start looking at these things. You can do a, there's a variety of things you can look look at that that give you. Um, Perhaps a, a, a better way in which the uh, a, a better representative way error might be measured in the human visual system. There's a there's a lot of other issues here about uh, the way also saccades work, the way the eye scans images, and you can bury error in in funny places. Uh, just tuck it under the carpet essentially, because the uh, the, the saccades of the, uh, the the saccades of the human visual system, especially under stereo. Um, do allow you to actually take some advantage of that. We take no advantage of that in most graphic systems, as, a, as an example. Yep? So how has the introduction of new hardware like GPUs changed your research agenda or the educational part? It's, um, it's made it much more complicated. In some ways, I wish they didn't exist. <laughs> um, because people look at architectures first. And it goes back to, you know, most of us, I, 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 most of us come from a traditional academic background, and you want to teach the fundamentals first. And a lot of people come from a specific API and a specific graphics card, for that matter, and want to shoehorn everything into that model of the world. Uh, so it does create a problem. On the other hand, it creates an interesting opportunity to talk about engineering. Um, it, especially with a lot of uh, graphics cards that are highly data parallel. Um, our, you know, our kind of multi thread GPUs are not so data parallel. So you can talk about sweet spots of both, but I feel that that really should be sort of a second course or follow on after we look at more fundamental things um, so that we understand, for example, why it takes weeks to compute real light transport versus hundredths of a second to compute direct illumination on a graphics card. Okay, that's a signal. That might be a signal. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, thank you.
the notion of the story itself might 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 have an effect. Now, obviously, I'm I'm um, starting to push push the envelope of what can be got done merely with technology. A user has to be involved in here at some point. But you can see where I'm getting at. The the um, we seem to have this endless set of expectations, and even when we think we're done from the point of view of narrative, along come some people decide they want behaviors in their characters. This is uh, just out of an editing, the editor for Spore. So we'll really need something more complex as, as to what a scene is. A scene is going to have to be something uh, it's, it's going to have to have some geometry, some material properties, some kind of evolutionary model, I mean how it can change some behavioral model, maybe how it can interact, and something, something I that sort of puts it all together in, in terms of how all these things interact overall. And, um, and then we can kind of condition this by budget and, and a variety of other constraints. So really what this thing has, has now become known as, by the way, is, is what, what people now are called a digital asset. A lot of people are starting to sell these things. So you'll, you'll spend a lot of time constructing something within a production, re a production modeling system um, maybe a really, really good face that does a variety of things, it's emotive and so on, you'll package it now. Packaging itself is an interesting problem. Um, and then try to sell it, or at least try to commoditize it uh, in various ways. So in the limit, um, uh, I'm not going to do a reduction, I'm not going to use the reduction symbol, but in the, uh, because I'm not really sure what reduces to what. In the limit, AI certainly and, and, um, and this image semantics is, uh, are kind of on a par, because that'll give us virtual humans that talk and walk and can interact with regular people. Um, I always loved this guy, Vlad, Vlad uh, Bill Teitla. His, his name was never Bill, it's Vladimir Peter Teitla. He's the guy who did Dumbo, uh, but he called himself Bill. I've never really, quite, never really understood that. In any case, we want to encapsulate some of the knowledge uh, of, of him uh, so that it interacts well, or uh, so that, so that uh, regular people potentially could at least be motivated um, to do animations uh, along the lines of what he did. No one can ever do the virtuoso thing, except for virtuosos, of what Teitler did for Dumbo. But it'd be really nice if we could embed enough knowledge in uh, production systems to allow um, animations to be created by regular people to be really expressive. Um, we need biomechanics render, we need biomechanics in these systems so that we get simulated creatures with muscles that can act and interact with the real physical world. And we need aesthetics somehow to give us some social and cultural awareness. We need light transport, which will, sim will, will simulate virtual environments. Okay. And um, so obviously we won't be, won't be um, um, unemployed for a long time to come. I want to talk a tiny bit about educational perspectives. Um, first is that there's a ton, uh, there's a ton of chasms. One is that be between what we call a classroom, whether it's at the undergraduate or graduate levels, and practice. Uh, the guys in practice, guys and girls in practice are doing really hard work, but it involves a different kind of synthesis than what we, than what we teach, of course, in, um, uh, in the classroom. Uh, there's a, a, likewise a similar problem between, between those doing their masters and PhD theses and the software products that uh, their uh, innovations might end up in. And there's a huge gulf between the products and the artists or users. So that's one, that's, that's, there's three, at least three chasms there, probably more. So I'm kind of arguing now, I actually am now directing a professional master's program in which we're trying to look at these things at the University of Toronto. Um, as if, I, I, after being department chair, I promised I wouldn't run anything again. Uh, but somehow I got into this because I actually like the idea. Um, I think that the only way to do this is actually take people outside of the, the university. Um, get people in, in, embedded get them into uh, real software development houses, into uh, production houses, work with artists, um, and use perhaps a professional program to kind of go between the two. And I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you. Right. It would so in the model it would work uh, it, so somehow in, in the in that I that I uh, uh, that, that the, inter the interaction model. So you've got objects um, hitting one another, and the, the problem there, of course, is that you might have a completely smooth system, uh, but I might bump into something, and suddenly there's a collision. That's a nonlinear thing. In fact, just a foot strike's nonlinear. Uh, so swinging a foot is really a rather beautiful C2 system, right? So beautiful. As soon as you kick something, though. Uh, you've got a collision. You've got now uh, a different kind of a different kind of problem, both geometric 
and mechanical. Which is one reason, by the way, why I think geometric mechanics is another area, uh, is, is, a, is actually a rather interesting place for uh, to, uh, an area of, of uh, exploration for computer graphics. So, uh, but what, what measurement of what of what of what phenomena though? Uh, you know, the differing, for example. Yes. So um, the the usual thing that can be used is um, um, you can do uh, what this proves really is nothing more than L two on a pixel by pixel basis is, is not is not good or L L L P. Um, but you can take windows and start looking at these things. You can do a, there's a variety of things you can look look at that that give you. Um, Perhaps a, a, a better way in which the uh, a, a better representative of the way error might be measured in the human visual system. There's a there's a lot of other issues here about uh, the way also saccades work, the way the eye scans images, and you can bury error in in funny places. Uh, just tuck it under the carpet essentially, because the uh, the, the saccades of the, uh, the the saccades of the human visual system, especially under stereo. Um, do allow you to actually take some advantage of that. We take no advantage of that in most graphic systems, as, a, as an example. Yep. So how has the introduction of new hardware like GPUs changed your research agenda or the educational part? It's, um, it's made it much more complicated. In some ways, I wish they didn't exist. <laughs> um, because people look at architectures first. And it goes back to, you know, most of us, I, 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 most of us come from a traditional academic background, and you want to teach the fundamentals first. And a lot of people come from a specific API and a specific graphics card, for that matter, and want to shoehorn everything into that model of the world. Uh, so it does create a problem. On the other hand, it creates an interesting opportunity to talk about engineering, um, it, especially with a lot of uh, graphics cards that are highly data parallel. Um, our, you know, our kind of multi-thread GPUs are not so data parallel, so you can talk about sweet spots of both, but I feel that that really should be sort of a second course or follow-on after we look at more fundamental things um, so that we understand, for example, why it takes weeks to compute real light transport versus hundredths of a second to compute direct illumination on a graphics card. Okay, that's a signal. That might be a signal. <laughs>